My first, this is my first visit to Koponik. Uh, my first visit to Belgrade was exactly almost the, the month 30 years ago when I came to meet a good friend, Dragoslav Avramovich, to ask him to partner on an international commission where we were studying the changes just at the end of the Cold War. I remember how proud he was to take me around Belgrade at that time and show how different this country was, this place was, from what was going on further east, and in one sense, from what was going on in the west. But this was a country with a unique spirit, with a unique history, with a unique pride and sense of self-reliance. I have not visited Serbia very often in the last 30 years. I did come last year and a few times earlier, but I have been going around to the countries of Southeast Europe quite a bit, conducted more than 20 conferences in the different countries, met with hundreds and hundreds of thought leaders and political leaders there. And I must say, I have not seen the spirit that I found here anywhere else in the region. And this is something I always, when I thought, when I think of this country, when I think of your history, this is what I value most. This sense that we will determine our future. And this was a unique heritage of this country, even during the Cold War, when you set out on your own path that significantly differed from both what was going on on both sides of you uh, in the world. And I think it's critical, absolutely critical, not only for you, but what I'd like to explain for the rest of the world, that you continue on that. The results you've achieved over the last five years are truly remarkable. They're very impressive. And in many respects, an outsider from the region would say, well, after all, you've only overcome problems that maybe you created in the first place. You're only doing what other countries have done. You're only following a standard set of policies, but you have done it, and you have done it successfully. But I hope in the next five years, in the next 10 years, when people come here, when they come to look at what Serbia has done from here, not to catch up, not to imitate, not to follow the standard recipes that were absolutely essential because of the critical situation the country was in. I hope the word they will hear, the word they will say, is what we heard from the Prime Minister, creative diplomacy. Creative diplomacy. Why do I say that? I'm not, I have not come here as an expert to give you advice. I'm sure you have had plenty of that. Uh, I had my own experience right at the end of the Cold War, working in the, in the Soviet Union, just at the time when the country was breaking up. Dragoslav Avramovich was a close companion. Uh, we looked and watched the country, the, the, the region, presiding over the largest robbery of public property in the history of the world. We saw long lines of experts from Washington and other places peddling the Washington consensus of saying, this is the shortcut to your freedom, prosperity, and we saw what happened. In 1994, Mikhail Gorbachev asked us to come in and conduct a conference to talk about what's happening and what is really going on in this rapid restructuring. When we finished that, Drag Avramovich agreed to write a chapter for our report to the, to the United Nations on what's wrong with this approach. And what are the price, the tremendous price in suffering that's going to be, uh, go on behind it, be, because of it. But I'd like to talk now not about, I will come back in my remarks to some ideas that I hope you'll find relevant to this country 
for the next five years, but I'd like to spend a little time talking about what's going on in the rest of the world to put this in perspective. Essentially to tell you that I believe following the standard procedures, st the standard policies that have brought you this far are not a solution for Serbia's future and they're not a solution for the world's future. We have, we face today, the world faces today, unprecedented crisis, challenges, multi-dimensional challenges. I think much of this is going to be addressed in the next two days, I hope, of this conference. We have a political challenge which seems to have come out of nowhere. After all, at the end of the Cold War, wasn't this supposed to be the end of history? And finally, now authoritarian is over and communism is over, and now we can go ahead and really have a life of, of freedom and prosperity uh, and, uh, and unlimited growth. Why then? Why then do I, when I sit listening to you, am more conscious of the problems in my own country than here? Why do we see in the bastions of democracy a revolt, a revolution, a serious dissent from the institutions which we've been propagating for centuries? Why do we hear the President of the United States going back on the free market uh, uh, project which, he's, which America has been advocating throughout the 20th century? Why do we see the UK uh, talking about Brexit? These are questions of tremendous relevance to the world in the future. They're not an accident. They're not just a, uh, a bizarre uh, uh, fact of the moment. They're not going to go away. In 1947, when the Mount Pelerin Society met in Switzerland, their goal was, these were people, intellectual, brilliant intellectuals, idealistic intellectuals, and their main concern was that authoritarianism in any form, economic or political, should not threaten the freedoms of the Western world. And they didn't know how to handle that. They didn't know what to do about it. And so they said, after all, the one thing that we can count on is that if property is private, if economy is left free, major human freedoms will be preserved. It looked to be a very rational proposition at that time, I believe, uh, put forth with the greatest of sincerity. But what's the reality today? The reality today is that our economic neoliberalism is the greatest threat to democracy in the world. That's the view I have. That's the view we've been studying and going around the world. We had a meeting at World Bank just three months ago on the same topic because the economic system that's working today for growth, and we do need growth, you need growth, no doubt, but what is that growth? Growth for what? Growth for who? Growth for what end? We've got a globalization of trade, we've got a financialization of the global markets, we've got growth that is benefiting a smaller and smaller minority at the top, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the data, I don't have to cite them, to say that for an increasing portion of the population in the West, after the end of the Cold War, after the victory, quote victory, uh, we have living standards that are stagnant, people with less economic security, with less confidence in the future, youth who are more concerned and that's the real reason why we've got youth in America finally for the first time since the 60s coming forward and saying we must participate. We must do something to change this system. We can't live by a dogma that is increasingly marginalizing us. I'm not trying to minimize any of the accomplishments of this country. I'm happy, delighted to hear about them. I'm proud to know uh, that you are doing this. But for me, it's not the philosophy that's the key. For me, it's the determination. The, the, the strength, the determination, the self-reliance. That's what you really have accomplished and demonstrated here. And that's what you need for the future. We don't need the whole world following 
the neoliberal model that's already we're disillusioned of in increasing numbers in the West. What's, what's America going to do when Chinese state capitalism, state capitalism shows that it's a more competitive system than private sector economy? What are we going to do? We're going to put up the tariff barriers again. We're going to repudiate all of the policies we've been advocating for everybody else for a century. It's interesting, if you, for those of you who know the history, that the, the UK became the, the, the leader in the advocacy of free trade after, after it was the dominant trading company in the, uh, co country in the world, not before, not when everybody else was vulnerable, not when it was vulnerable. Or, uh, and that's what, uh, uh, that, that's the fact. Do we have an economic system for the world that's really an answer for all humanity? Or if humanity is too big for you, for every Serbian, not just the business leaders, not just the wealthy, but for every Serbian, because the future of our society is going to depend on that. You talk about growth. Growth is absolutely essential, but what growth do we want? We have an economic system today. There's a paradox. We have a unique paradox. We have a, a world with unprecedented social resources that we've never had before in the world. We have more than $150 trillion in global financial assets. But how much of it is it really being invested for human well-being and welfare, or even for the real economy and job creation. By most estimates, I'd say less than 15 or 20 percent. We have tremendous technological uh, uh, potentials, but how much are those technological potentials really being directed for the welfare of people and not just for economic activity? We've had tremendous gains from technology. We all enjoy them and all. We're organizing a conference with IEEE. Some of you may know that's the leading institution in the world, professional institution of electrical and electronic engineers. We're co-organizing a meeting with them on cognitive computing because that they know themselves that the technology is not the answer. The question is, what's going to be the social impact of that technology? Is McKinsey right? Is World Economic Forum right that we're going to end up eliminating 40 or 50 percent of the jobs? Then what is this technology for? Are we going to change the system so that the Mac, so that we tax robots and uh, and technology that we that we limit, we raise high capital gains and be sure that the profits that companies make go to the people or go to the society because act. After all, no, no company invents the technology that we're using today. It's a cumulative benefit achieved by humanity as a whole. Are we prepared to reform the whole social and political and legal system to redistribute the benefits of the technology to everybody? If we are not, then what are we looking at? What are we asking for? What do we expect in the future? We're going to eliminate the jobs then who, who's going to be the consumer for us? And which is the society we can live in? Seeing it in my own country, and for, uh, for many of you who've been there, lived there, uh, studied there, uh, it's disconcerting. It's disconcerting for the whole world today. It's not going to go away just because uh, uh, one president goes away. This is deeper seated. This is touching the population. It's something that has to be addressed. And I think that's why we need the kind of creative diplomacy. We need the kind of new thinking. I don't see it coming out of my own country, I'm sorry to say. I met a leading economist from uh, Yale uh, a few months ago. He was a leading internationally known labor economist. And I said, oh, you're a labor economist. Well, I've done a lot of work on employment. And I started to engage in a discussion with him. And he said, oh, that's not my field. That's not your field. Employment is separate from labor. 
And then I said, well, you know, there's a lot of serious concern in Europe and within the universities among the young graduate students that we have to challenge this economic orthodoxy where we're not even being taught the fact that there are 20 or 30 or a, a hundred different theoretical perspectives on how economy works and should work. We're only taught one and come out in the world and then we find out there's a lot of diversity. And I said, what's going on in America now? He said, we don't have that problem. He really frightened me. He said, we are all teaching the same thing. Now that's really frightening. If we've solved all the problems we have, then okay, let's stop and quit while we're ahead. We've, economics today, we've got a triple or a five-fold divorce in our economic system today. We've got our financial markets are more and more separated, divorced, separate, and I would argue even undermining the real economic growth of the world. We've got our production more and more separated from employment generation, income generation than ever, and that's going to only increase unless we do something radically different. We've got the ecological challenge. For 200 years, we've had economic theory, uh, ever since uh, uh, we ignored Malthus. For 200 years, we've had economic theory that uh, ignores the environmental impact or the environmental limits. Can we go on this way in the future? Yes, for five years, you can strike up uh, remarkable achievements, but we need more. I'm looking for more from Serbia than that. I'm looking for you with the individuality of this perspective, being between two worlds for so long, to really think, rethink, not just the economy, rethink the society, rethink the political system. Not just Serbia, of course. There are others. I find, in one sense, more common sense in this intermediate region, people from this region, than I do on, on either of the other extremes. Because there's some kind of a, you've had the dual experience. You know the value of freedom. You value that autonomy and that freedom. But you also know the value of social stability, social relationships, social cohesiveness. I was very happy to hear the Prime Minister talking about values. What are the values of our economic system today? Do we have a value system other than growth, other than profit, other than maximizing uh, productivity? How can we revamp our economic theory? It's not just institutions and policies. Our problem starts with the way we're thinking. We've divided up reality piecemeal into so many parts. We've separated each as if it's an independent whole. We want to be, pretend that if we get the economics right, we'll automatically get the politics right, and we'll get the social stability right, and we'll get the eco eco ecology right. It, can you, is there anyone in the world, any institution in the world, that has taken all the goals that we can naturally aspire for. For convenience, we can talk about the 17 SDGs because that's a good collective agreement of humanity on what we should be aspiring for. But has anybody worked out how can we achieve all these goals? Yes, we can achieve the growth by destroying the environment or by adopting technologies that raise inequality more and more. Can we achieve all of them? We need new thinking. We need new thinking, fresh ideas. By all means, borrow all the great sound ideas and policies and institutions and systems you can from anywhere in the world that's done it well. But realize, however well it's been done elsewhere, we don't have the answers today. We need new thinking creative thinking, innovative thinking, to realize we as humanity, it's not a question of blaming anybody. I, I'm a social scientist. I don't blame economists or any other scientists for the inadequacy of our th theories. This is the most, the greatest challenge that humanity's ever faced. Our success has been tremendous over the last two centuries, 
but our thought has not evolved far enough. We've, ma we've balanced or, let's say, based ourselves too much on trying to imitate the natural sciences. I had a, we did a colloquium at CERN uh, with physicists, and I said, you know, we'd like to learn a lot from the natural scientists, and then we ended up in our discussion realizing the complexity of the challenges that are faced in the social sciences are infinitely greater than anything that exists in the purely physical world. There's nothing for us to be ashamed of if we don't have all the answers. <laughs> we have taken up a much more complex problem because we're conscious human beings. We're individuals. We are value-based. And we need a social science that doesn't resemble uh, econometrics of physics. We need a social science that's a human-centered social science that looks and sees the relationship between economics, governance, uh, uh, society, environment, human security, physical security. We're now going back to the talk of the uh, arms race that we thought we had buried and left behind 30 years earlier. So I would just like to, this is the context that we see that uh, we think we need your help. We need your help, we need the help of, of every open-minded person who's not lost in ideology or founded their whole career or their whole institutional basis on proving that theory that was outmoded 30 years ago, I would argue some of it was outmoded in the Great Depression and the only reason that uh, uh, it wasn't fully rejected was because we introduced the news deal and then we had social democracy that was the great benefit and boon of Western Europe which has been abandoned to such a large extent. And Western Europe looks a lot more like North America today uh, than it did 30, 40 years ago. Uh, we've gone in one direction. We need an answer that really addresses all the issues. I know that there's been a great expectation in this country of, of joining the EU. For me, the EU is one of the greatest advances of humanity in history, unprecedented experiment in history, but it's a partial experiment. We've tried to go ahead and forge economic union when we, the people in the nations of the, of the EU still regard themselves as separate people, more concerned about their own welfare than a, a, the welfare of everybody else in the union. We've done economic union without the political union needed. And we've layered layer and layer and layer of rule and law and procedure. I, we had a conference in Lisbon in which the, finance, the foreign minister of Lisbon, who was a social scientist, said he found out after becoming the foreign minister that the real job, his real job was to go to Brussels and negotiate trade agreements and policy agreements which were really decided not on any rule or logic or even economic principle, it was simply decided on who has the most power. And why is it that the power, it's the elephant in the room, why is it not the center of economic thought? The thing that's governing the way our economies work today is not the rules of a free market, it's who has the power. Who has the power to exercise and impose on other people? We need a social science that honestly admits and recognizes that power is part of the equation. And all the formulas of our experience over the last 300 years, I mean our collective experiences, that the greater the distribution of power and the more equitable the distribution of power, the more successful the society is. Not just economically, politically, socially, in terms of peace and all. What are we doing about that today? What is our economic theory telling us about that today? Except people like Piketty and a few who are outspokenly concerned about it. I'd like to just mention a few areas where, and I say this with, out of my very limited exposure to Serbia today, but based on my experience, 
in addition to wonderful things I've heard from the finance minister and the, far, and the prime minister about the things you're addressing in future. It was interesting when the prime minister talked about what we're going to do in future, it wasn't all the implementation of the, the, the policies uh, that were necessary for balancing the budget and all. It was about building the society. There was talk of education. There was talk of e-governance. There was talk of social systems. There was talk of agriculture and ecology and all. And I think that's really where the great potential lies. And I'd like to mention four areas. In my career, I'm a business consultant. I've worked with companies from multinationals down to startups and uh, small entrepreneurial businesses. In 1980, some of you may remember, 1978 to 1980, Chrysler Corporation lost more money than any company in history at that time. By today, it's small change, but at that time, it was a lot. And all the predictions of the experts on Wall Street and the experts in Detroit was, Chrysler will be out of business in six or 12 months. At that time, myself and a small group, we did an independent study of Chrysler, and we wrote to Iacocca and said, certainly the experts are right. This is possible. Chrysler could be out of business. But when we look at the rich heritage and capabilities of this organization, we also believe that it could emerge from this crisis much stronger than it was before. The history, some of you may know, in order to avoid a, a failure that would have involved the loss of a few hundred thousand jobs, the US gave 10-year bank guarantees to try to hold up the, country, the, the company a little longer. That didn't work because after getting those bank guarantees for 1.3 billion, Chrysler was down to about fifth, uh, $10 million in the bank uh, on, on daily expenditures of about 30 million, didn't help. But in the next three years, I, Chrysler earned more money than it had earned in, cumulatively in the previous 59 years of its existence. It defied all the experts. Uh, people were saying Iacocca, Lee Iacocca for president. But to pawn it off or just say it's a, because of a brilliant single individual and he deserves credit for what he did is to miss the point. The organization which everybody thought was dead had this much of potential in it, which even the experts missed. They had written it off like uh, so many of the public sector companies in Eastern Europe were written off and closed down because they were deemed to be uh, 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 un unsalvageable. 19 1984, we went in and did a study of Apple Corporation, and I was talking to my co-author about the great future potential of Apple, and then six months later, the board threw Steve Jobs out. They just threw him out. And over the next 10, 11 years, Chrysler's, uh, sorry, Apple's market share went from 15% to 5% in the US market. It was much lower elsewhere. And then they brought Jobs back. And when they brought him back, the, the business press interviewed Michael Dell, who at that time was not just founder, but CEO of the then largest PC company in the world. And they said, what's your advice to Jobs? He said, my advice to Jobs is that he liquidates all the assets and returns whatever is there for the shareholders, because Apple doesn't have a prayer in the world. And in 12 years, Apple was the most valuable company in the history of the world. So my first point is, this is true not only of the big companies, not only of those that have great leaders, this is true of companies that, in my own experience, of all level, even in industries which are dying and going out of business, even in companies that are considered. So one of my suggestions is, apart from whatever else you're doing, look at a program to, in, to massively upgrade the quality of management, I'm not just talking about financial management, I mean people management, organizational management, customer relations, production management, in as many companies as possible, big and small. It's very encouraging that uh, I saw the demonstration, the pr presentation last night, you have two, 200 digital startups in the country. Why not 2,000? Why not 20,000? But if your MBA 
program here is anything like the MBA program that's being taught in other parts of the world, we are not really teaching our youth to become entrepreneur, successful entrepreneurs. We're teaching them to do functional work as accountants, to work in banks or insurance companies, or perform marketing roles. An entrepreneur has to understand business in its totality. So look at the potential of all your existing companies. Come up with a program to see how you can elevate the performance. My own very conservative estimates a minimum, we can improve the performance of the companies in the country on an average of 25% in two or three years. What will that do to your growth? What will that do to the employment? Instead of paying foreign companies to come here and create jobs uh, for, for whatever reason, why shouldn't we be investing that money to develop the people here, the dynamism here, the, the entrepreneurial capacity here? that you already have. Second, employment. Uh, it was briefly mentioned uh, when I was introduced back in 1991, and this was largely due to the influence of Dragoslav Avramovich. We took, conducted a study in India of the potential for full employment. This was such an absurd idea that nobody had ever asked even how much jobs you would have to create to create full employment, let alone how you would do it. The, the short answer is you'd need to create 100 million jobs in 10 years. Well, when you see data like that, you know there's no way to do anything about this, so you better quit while you're ahead. Uh, incidentally, I was in Croatia about five years ago at the leading economic institute, and I said, what is your program for full employment in the country? And they blinked at me and they said, well, we don't have a program. I said, why not? Nobody ever asked us. Well, we asked the question and we came up with a strategy and it was unbelievable to me. Within three months, the prime minister, the cabinet, and the entire government of India had approved this strategy and made it official policy of the government. Have we asked that question? You're doing a lot to create jobs. Can we ask the question, is there any way we could create full employment in Serbia? Not by calculating how much investment we need. Where are those jobs? Where are the human needs that are not being met? Whether it's in education or healthcare or in services or in IT sector uh, for sure, or, or in any other uh, area, agriculture, it's a good, uh, good place to look. I'm sure you will discover enormous untapped social potential. When we look at things from the macro level, very often we miss the great real opportunities that are there at the level of people and at the level of enterprises and at the level of the local markets. It's a rich potential to be tapped. In 1994, and I'll try to wrap up because I know we're already very behind schedule, 1994, I was visiting Dragoslav Avramovich in his Geneva. He had three homes, one in Geneva, one in Belgrade, one in Maryland. And we were sitting there because I asked him to write the chapter for our report to the UN on the transition in Eastern Europe. And while we were talking about it, he had a call from the president's office in Belgrade asking him to come back because they have a very serious problem of hyperinflation. Uh, and uh, they want his advice. And we discussed it because we had been looking at a, pro a solution for hyperinflation in Russia at that time. Well, you know the rest of the story. He came back, he presented to the cabinet. The cabinet asked him, what are the chances that this could work? He said, nobody's ever done it before. And nobody's ever handled hyperinflation under these extreme circumstances. So. My guess is maybe 30 or 35%. They said, fine, we're gonna do it and you're in charge. And they made him the governor, the governor of the bank to do it. And within 10 days, inflation rates came down to single digit. Now, what does that tell us about money? Uh, our speaker from MasterCard spoke the magic word, trust. The whole money system, the whole economic system, the whole political system, the whole legal system is based on a social infrastructure, a psychological infrastructure of trust and confidence. And if we can create that trust and confidence 
I think the spirit with which the government is going ahead merits that. We can create money. He created a parallel currency. Why not do it again? Now that there's blockchain there, there are some very interesting proposals out there. All the major central banks in the world are studying how they can use blockchain to create their own direct currency that can target money into the economy without having to go through the banking system where 90% of it gets lost, gets off for speculation, uh, or gets off for shareholder value and buybacks rather than really stimulating jobs and the real economy. And last, I'm very happy to hear that uh, so many of the speakers mentioned education. And I'm really grateful to Alexander Blahovic and Dragan Durasin and Nabosha uh, Neskowicz, who are working with us. We're organizing a conference here in November in Belgrade on the future of education. We've been studying all over the world and where education is. In the best of countries, the potential for elevating our educational system, I'm not talking about massive investments, and, and all, I'm talking about just to make education more effective. Uh, this is a critical driver, and it's not just a question about getting technology in the classroom, though that can be helpful. But the real thing is we've got to shift education from stuffing information into the heads of students to bringing out their curiosity, their capacity to learn. It's the human being we're trying to develop, not the subject. We want human beings that are more motivated, more capable, have a greater understanding, can be more productive citizens in the world. And I, this country seems to be born for it. Why not do it here? Uh, we had, a, in a conference in Brazil a few months ago, we had a, uh, the, the head of uh, ECO 42, I don't know if any of you know about it, started by an IT billionaire in, uh, in France. He wanted to streamline and upgrade the education for computer programmers, for digital programmers. He created an institution with 3,000 students and only seven faculty members, and none of them were teachers. The students were teaching themselves, they were learning in a project basis, and he showed and demonstrated that within 18 months, those that were motivated would be fully employable, or better than that, they would be so much independent, they would go out and start their own companies. The next one was set up in Silicon Valley. Uh, now there are 12 of them, one of them's in Kiev. Uh, why not? take models like this from around the world that can completely revamp the pedagogy of our education. The idea is not to catch up and imitate the Harvards and Oxfords, and even if some of you have been and had the benefit of their education. That's not what's going to change the world and prepare the society. We need a new paradigm in education, and there are enough ideas out there to do it. Why not do it here? So I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I really look forward to watching the progress of this country. Uh, I believe that uh, the, the name of Serbia is going to be much bigger than the population in the future. Uh, and the world needs it, not just you. Thank you.